Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Talk Show. we got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about what Jesus actually looked like. Yeah, we're going to look at early Christian art. Uh, we're going to look at what Scripture says about Jesus' appearance. We're going to look at different miracles where our Lord appeared. And we're going to look at um, a lot of different ways that Jesus has been portrayed throughout cultures throughout the centuries. And we're going to look at this guy. Did Jesus look like him? Maybe he looked like him. Let's find out. Let's find out. Yes. Excited to be here. The if you're not watching on YouTube, that man that Father Rich Pagano was pointing at is Jonathan Rumi. Welcome you to the studio here with Father Rich and Ryan. And hey that's guys. a perfect invitation. So make sure you're checking us out on YouTube. Not only just listening in, because trust me, this episode you want to watch. This. You really want to watch this episode. <laughs> because I've got to say, guys, Jonathan, mm. when I look at your face, man, I feel a lot of peace in my heart. Right on, man. God has God has totally blessed you with a, a, a face of countenance and and a look of integrity in your eye, man. And it's it's awesome to meet you. Thank you. By the way, and we just Likewise. welcome you to the show, brother. Yeah, thanks for coming, Jonathan. I'm really excited yeah. to be here, guys. Yeah, I, I couldn't wait to uh, to come by once once I heard about you and, and discovered that uh, you guys are doing this. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about your career. So you're an actor and a voiceover actor. Yes, right. I'm an actor uh, and a voiceover guy. Um, I've been working a long time. I started in uh, animation back in New York City, working on a show called Celebrity Deathmatch for MTV. Oh, I love that great show. show. That was a great for those show. Of you old enough to remember that yeah, show. Man. How old are you, by the way? Because I think we're all around roughly the same. He's not yet forty years old. He's thirty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's thirty-three. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it at that. Let's just say thirty-three. Yeah. Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Jesus is always thirty-three in my heart. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a uh, I had a previous career as a location scout in New York City. I started as a PA and uh, became a location scout and location manager and worked on a bunch of pretty cool movies and then decided to come out west where the weather was a lot better. Mm. And, um, isn't that the truth? Yeah. And then pursue this thing full time. So you got a lot of roles, I'm sure throughout your career, but just based on looking at you, I think one of the roles that you have and that you've played on multiple occasions is playing Jesus. That's right. That's yeah. right. I've played, I've been playing Jesus in one project or another, um, for the last five years now, I think five years. Yeah. It started with a, um, a one woman show as a part, I'm not the woman, but it was, uh, <laughs> um, but your hair looks Jesus. fabulous. Your hair looks fabulous. Yeah, it was a part of a, a one woman show that had a video, like a mixed media element, like a video element to it, where there were um, characters on the screen, uh, one of whom was Jesus, and I, I got cast to do that. But my hair wasn't as long at the time, so they had to give me a wig, which <laughs> really didn't look great. Not as natural yeah. as your hair right now. It, was, kinda, it was yellow. And <laughs> Over. Just, just yeah. Over. Like, why is Jesus having blonde comb over? It makes no sense. <laughs> it was shot in the seventies, dude. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just. Yeah. It was a while ago. A lot of license. <laughs> yeah. A lot of license. Yeah, and then that led to a couple of short films by a director named Dallas Jenkins, who, who I've been um, friends with for the last uh, five years now as well. And I did a few films with him, and working on another project with him, and um, and then I did uh, a number of. Um, you were a voice actor too, right? Uh, yes, yes, I'm a and voice actor. And I use some really well. cool things that I think a lot of our fans would know. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of video game work. I, I've been in uh, a couple of games that people may know, like Fallout 4, um, God of War 4, um, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, all the fours. All the all fours. fours. <laughs> yeah. I'm seeing awesome. a theme here. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so God of War was my jam, man. I, I, I really, really enjoyed that. Oh, my, cool game. my nephews yeah. are going to love this. It's oh, a beautiful great. game. Yeah. Cool. So you did a lot of like, ah! It comes. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing a frag. <laughs> Throw a frag. Duck and cover. A lot of that stuff. A lot of the military. I've known games. your mom biblically. No, that's not that. <laughs> no, wrong, one. wrong one. Or like, get to the chopper. Yeah. That's no, right, that was yeah. was that different? That's not in. No, that's, that's, not in that's Arnold. That's uh, Arnold. Arnold. Yeah. yeah that, no, that was in Mafia yeah. Three. I did that in Mafia <laughs> Three. Uh, he was on a three that time. So yeah. I, I I really do have to say I'm I'm sitting here and I'm I'm, I'm listening to you talk and you're mm -hmm. telling your experience was super cool, but it's tripping me out. It's like it looks like 
you really do look like how I think of Jesus. And it's, it's, it's yeah. wigging me out a little bit. And, and dude, I got to say, Sheila, I've known you for a long time and we've done a lot of shows. You're behaving a little bit more charitably. He is. Right now, isn't he? Yeah. Look, his face is glowing and everything. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Normally your countenance is like, a, <laughs> I don't know. He doesn't look like, like a Jesus. Bear. I know. Yeah, it he doesn't look like a Jesus. But I do think that the way that, uh, the way that you appear is how most people would traditionally picture oh, yeah. our Lord uh, as having appeared in his earthly life and earthly ministry. But uh, in today's show, we're going to look at, is that actually the case? Is that actually, do you look like Jesus or do you just look like what um, popular art and uh, devotional art has trained us to think of what Jesus looks like? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, could we wreck his career or something? If we, <laughs> if we get to the bottom yeah, of it? If we get to the oh, bottom Lord, of it, it's like, no. <laughs> I don't know. This doesn't come out for a little while, right? (laughs) I think I I work so hard, you guys. (laughs) Great. Now they're casting people who have, you know, short blonde hair and are Korean as Jesus because that's what he really looked like. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I mean, I think when you look, when you go back in history, I mean, you have to look at, you know, some cultural and artistic expressions of the Jewish people of that era. And then also, you know, looking at the the art that comes. I'm thinking of, you know, that mosaic in Rome that was discovered in excavation and now is the, you know, the excavated location where you can go and, and pray near the tomb of St. Peter himself. And yeah, but in that, in that image in Rome. So this is an important thing. A lot of the early art of Jesus and the depictions of Jesus were not intended to depict what he physically looked like. Uh, like a lot of sacred art, it was meant to depict a theological truth, mm. right? So if you look at the earliest depictions of him in Rome, he was pictured uh, looking like Apollo. Mm-hmm. He was because he was a god. He was a luminous god. And that's what they were depicting. And him it was at that's the edge of evangelical delivery. Right. You know, like they were they were trying to evangelize a people that were these pagan gods were right. at the center of their day to day life. Mm. Right. So it was always rooted in evangelization. Right. So this image would have said more than this is what he looked like. It would have mm-hmm. said this is who he was. Right. So it was a theological like like how a a stained glass window during the Middle Ages was able to instruct people on faith who were illiterate. This was the same thing. It was propaganda. If you look at um, then, if you went to the Near East and, and um, Asia Minor and the Holy Land, he would have appeared different in the art there. He would have appeared as what um, Tacitus and some of the early historians would have said as the image of a philosopher. The Romans considered all of... Uh, the people of Judea as a philosopher people. And the philosopher look was big beard robes. Yeah. That's why a lot of the artwork of that period showed him as a t- archetype of the philosopher. I don't look at Jesus as philosopher. Even though I really enjoy philosophy and I spent a lot of time in my undergrad years, you know, Jesus has always been, you know, granted, it, it's definitely crafted my philosophy. I think somebody like St. John Paul II, who is arguably one of the greatest philosophers, certainly of the 20th century, but even we can expand that even even more so. Um, granted, he would have drawn great philosophical foundations from Scripture and Revelation and the teachings of Christ. But, you know, I, I look to Jesus and it's like that face That is just so mysterious and it reveals, you know, like that fire in his eyes, you know, the, the, the scripture from revelation, you know, like that fire, his, his hair is white as snow and his eyes contain this fire, but it's this, like this, this fire, this look that that just communicates so much more uh, than philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the, the God that entered into his creation. Yeah. I mean, you think about that, that appearances and his eyes communicated that yeah you know that gaze communicated that and that's yeah. that's what I, I sit there and think of it because it it communicates all right now what is your ethnic background I am a bit of a mutt um, my father's from the Middle East mm-hmm. and my mother's from Ireland so my father was born in Egypt in okay. Cairo uh, and then his family is uh, Egyptian Syrian mm-hmm. Armenian and then my mother is Irish, English. So I think that's a very interesting point that you do have a, you have what would typically be described as a Mediterranean mm-hmm. skin complexion and coloring, right? Mm-hmm. 
Now, what do we know about the Jews of the first century, which our Lord was? He was a ethnic Hebrew Ju- Judean. And they would have had olive skin. They mm-hmm. would have had dark complexions. They would have had dark eyes. They would have dark hair, right? They so it's proven, dude. Jonathan, you're the guy, man. <laughs> it's like we're going in that direction. We're, Slow okay, down now. As far as we have more to talk about. As far as I know. <laughs> caught before the horse ran. Uh, as far uh, as I know, Jesus, except for on St. Patrick's Day when everyone was Irish, was not Irish, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Uh, but we do know that that is what the, the Semitic people of the time would have looked like. They would have looked very much like they do today, like Egyptians, like the Semitic people who are living there now, whether they're Palestinian or uh, Jewish or whatever. So there was a, a recreation. They had found a first century skull. And when you look up on the Internet, what did Jesus really look like? This is the image that always comes up, and it really irritates me because it is in no way what Jesus looks like. It's not like. that one where he's doing the thumbs up. From that movie, buddy Jesus. No, remember the dog movie? Jesus. Remember, remember that comedy? Dude, what are you I see that about? a lot on the internet. <laughs> buddy Jesus was not a recreation from a first century Judean skull. Oh, oh, Bro, yeah, you're I, killing me. I, it's just burned in my brain. That's it wasn't. All. It wasn't Kenny Loggins' Jesus, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. That's my favorite Jesus. Is Kenny it? Loggins' Jesus. I just I, I, n- nothing against Kenny Loggins. I just have a hard time when I'm like, what's he gonna sing? Danger Zone? I mean, what's Jesus singing Danger Zone? Peter. Hey, Peter. Hey, Peter. (laughs) Danger Zone. (laughs) Unless you're willing to follow me into the Danger Zone, you're not going to. Oh, that's excellent. There we go. So now here's an interesting thing, though, is that obviously the Jewish people of the first century and before and Stump till to still to this day had a prohibition against graven images. So mm. there's not a lot of historical and archaeological record of what Jewish people looked like at the time. They they didn't make images of themselves, so we don't know really what they dressed like, Interesting. what their hairstyle was, what their complexion was. But we can infer it from the art of the people who conquered them, right? There's mm. Roman coins that show the conquering of Judea, the conquering of of uh, uh, the rebellion, the Bar Kokhba rebellion and all these things. Mm-hmm. And you'll see the coinage of the Romans taking them away. And you'll see that typically they were wearing tunics, a short tunic underneath with a cincture and then above it another tunic, right? An outer tunic. You also see that they typically had beards, but not extraordinarily long beards. Mm. And they also had short hair. That's so right. soap opera beards. They had finally, so, now finally. I have a likeness to it. Yes, that's right. It's fantastic. I'm put a little, happy about this. Put a little goat smoke on there and have a little kitty <laughs> licking all over for you. He doesn't actually have to shave. He just has a cat licking yeah. <laughs> Very precisely, though. Yeah. I try, yeah. So we are able to infer that, you know, a lot of the imagery that we see of Jesus in robes is actually fairly accurate based on the depiction of Jewish people from those who were uh, uh, familiar with them. Uh, when they when they dress you up like Jesus, what do you got to wear? Well, it's interesting. So um, I recently had been working on a project and um, they had um, a rabbi on as a consultant and oh, he's awesome. also a first century historian. Oh, perfect. And we went through all of this um, because they're, they're endeavoring to, to make this, in this project, to be one of the most historically authentic depictions of Jesus in that time period mm-hmm. that's ever been put on film. And I, and I feel like they've, they've touched on all those things that you're talking about, Ryan. The phylacteries um, and the, the kellet and uh, the that's fringes. Right. Yeah. Tzit, tzit and all the yep. little things that the, they would the, have. The blue. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the hair was shorter. So, yeah. so right now my hair is a bit longer than it was when we were filming. Hmm. Um, but um, it's going back through rabbinic tradition and, mm-hmm. and, Men's hair, for instance, would have been noticeably shorter than women's hair. Absolutely. Now, because Jesus was, you know, a bit of a rebel, it, he might not have been as strict about, you know, maintaining those standards. So it could have been a little, maybe a little longer than than usual, but it wouldn't have been as long as we probably have been used to seeing mm-hmm. uh, over the course so of there, there was time. actually an interesting community, the Nazarites, at, that, right. at just, that period of time that John was associated with, John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. 
And it was a, you know, a pen- right. yeah, a penitential order. And they, they were not allowed to cut their hair. Right. And they actually had longer hair and, and they, and longer beards as well as not drinking whatsoever. So and that's we like know the that argument Jesus, that Jesus know was not a Nazarite. Yeah. Because Jesus, Jesus also turned water into wine. And, mm-hmm. and there's a number of selected readings from scriptures that show that Jesus participated and imbibed with his, with his, yeah, uh, his, apostles. Crit- his critics said that he, he drank too much. I thought you. I thought you were saying that his crew his really crew. enjoyed drinking. Right? Yeah, he would. He would. Him and his crew. They like to crack Jesus, open a Jesus, you got to slow ones. down on that wine, brother. And slow down on that, on that wine. You did two jugs yesterday. I mean, we got plenty left but over. But it's just so good. <laughs> it's just so good. Our critics say the same thing about us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, but another thing is that if you look at one of the, um, you, we were talking about Origin last night, and Origin was writing about 150 years after the earthly ministry of our Lord. And there was a, a Roman who was writing uh, counterpieces against Christianity. His name was Celsus. And Celsus wrote that, and this was known because he had interviewed people who, whose grandparents had actually seen Jesus. And they said that he was known for having a fairly shabby appearance. He was not anything that was uh, well kept. And Celsus, being a Roman and being a proper clean boy, Use this as a detraction that mm. he was he was not of high birth. He was not of well groomed clothes and stuff like that. But um, Origen said, "Well, of course not. He was an itinerant preacher, and he was he was a man of the, he was of the people. He was not he was not one of you Roman citizens." So there's a little bit of historical context there if you mm-hmm. look at it. Now Celsus's works don't exist; they're only referenced in Origen. We don't have mm-hmm. the original manuscripts of Celsus, but it's inferred from that document. And I, I love the, this connection between what, what Jonathan is saying as well as Scheel in relationship to also like the Roman perception of masculinity and, and being a man. It was you were clean shaven. You were clean shaven and yeah. short hair. And there was even references in, in uh, St. Paul's scriptures as well about that. And I forget the, the first reference. Corinthians first Corinthians 1114. Yeah. Do not, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's right. I had hair down to here like most of my life. <laughs> but the fascinating thing that I, I've spent so much time in, in the excavations in Rome and then praying with this mosaic, that's one of the older mosaics of a depiction of Jesus with Jesus clean shaven, but short hair. Is that hair. him with the lamb? Oh, wow. It's no, it, with, uh, he's at the helm of like these uh, horses. Is, it's a horse-drawn carriage, and it's one of the few renditions of Jesus without any facial hair whatsoever. I don't think I've ever seen that. It's beautiful, man, no. and it's actually where the accidentally they fell through the the floor right in that little tombed area, and that's where the excavation began was right next to this mosaic. Wow! And the what I like about it is it shows this appropriation. That this revelation of Jesus the Christ, the the Mashiach, this this uh, the Messiah, is now starting to be appropriated in different cultures and applied in different places. And the application one is sensitive to the pagan gods, and they use that as an evangelical curve. But then also, what is socially appropriate, so that it is attractive to the people that mm-hmm. you know you're serving artistically. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of a interesting point because I know we were talking about like the Jack. We, yeah, we Jack still see Jesus this to and, today. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll have. I mean, there's there's Korean Jesus and there's African American Jesus and there's blonde hair, blue eye, Northern European Jesus. There's uh, Slavic Jesus. There's Japanese Jesus. I mean, every culture takes the basic rubrics of what is un- Jesus is understood to look like: long hair, forked beard, parted in the middle, robes. And uh, those those theological trappings of halos and hand gestures, but then they they apply their their own ethnic look to them, and that's fine. That's good. That's Jesus is the savior of all people, uh, pagans and Jew alike, and representations of him that rep, that reflect their individual culture is a is a way that for people to gain greater communion with connect with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mary appears like that too. Mm-hmm. She does, you know, like mm-hmm. mama, like son, my personal opinion though, I think when it comes to contacting the real form and figure of the person of Christ, I, I just think I've got to go to the shroud of Turin and really pray with, with the shroud. And I know there's been a number of renditions of, of, you know, drawings and paintings that, depict that that figure so now with the shroud of Turin, there's two really cool things that i wanted to bring up with this episode one is there was the devotion called the devotion of the holy face 
Now, the devotion of the holy face was like, uh, uh, you know, a, a thing that a lot of people would meditate on and, and think of the visage of Christ and what that meant to them in their life. And it was very popular in about the mid 1850s until about World War One, and then the devotion started to die out a little bit. But it was based on the image of the Shroud of Turin and contemplating the holy face. Uh, it was actually so popular that St. Therese of Lisieux, her um, her name that when she joined the Carmelites was St. Therese or, or Therese of the child Jesus and the face of Christ. Or, I mean, I want to make sure I get that accurate. It was something like that. Yeah. Very close. That the holy face devotion was part of her actual name that she took. Um, and then the second thing about the Shroud of Turin is that there's a really great documentary about five, six years ago where they took... Uh, the Shroud of Turin took all the 3D data from that and created a computer model of what the man in the shroud would have looked like. And it is, it looks a lot like you. It really does. <laughs> it really does. All right, we're warming up. And here. We're, I mean, he's, we're he's got a career still. We're, we're in 20 minutes into the podcast and it's we're returning to it again. <laughs> yes, Jonathan, <laughs> you're doing well. So, so it would have, um, and I'll make sure... <laughs> I'll make sure that I post that image, but it's a really cool documentary. I should, I really think you guys should go. And was take this a look on History it. Channel? It was. It was by a guy named Ray Downing, who was a graphic and three D computer modeling artist. I think I might have seen that, yeah, and I cool. thought to myself, that guy looks like me. <laughs> it was a little creepy in a good way. Take, take a look. Oh, that, yes. oh yeah. That, oh, for sure. Let me see. That's the. There's yeah. a little yeah. glare there. Let me see. Wow. Yeah, looks a lot. Looks a lot like yeah. you. So, yeah. uh, I'll make sure I post that now. These side by side comparisons. Yeah, I will. <laughs> that'll be on our Facebook wall or whatever. So there's a couple other times where our Lord miraculously had his his image appear, and I think everyone knows the woman who wiped his face on the Via Della Rosa, which is Veronica. Veronica. So yeah, do you know I've been what the, there in that chapel? Do you know what the name Veronica means? That's not that was not a proper name. Woman who wipes the face. No. So Veronica. Is a it comes from the Greek word vero and icono, the true icon, Veronica. Ooh, That's oh, where gorgeous. Veronica comes from. It's the true icon of the true visage. Mm. So she wiped his face. And um, today yes. they consider that maybe the, um, I think it's called the Mendelian. And the Mendelian is uh, that image. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. That's a, that's a different image. That's the veil of Veronica. And I think that's in a church somewhere in Italy. Yeah. Now, the first king. I have a question for you. Sure. So I haven't seen that veil. So does there's an actual image on that veil still? Mm -hmm. Does that match up with the shroud? So that one does not because the shroud would have been postmortem. Mm. So there is a thing. That's right. There is called there. No, the Mandelian is that there's a thing called the Sudarium of Oviedo. Now the Sudarium of Oviedo would have been the cloth that was put over his face mm -hmm. in Jewish burial customs before the larger shroud was put in to wipe off the blood. That actually does match up directly with the Shroud of Turin, both in the blood patterns and the blood type. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the Veil of Veronica is, uh, yeah, that's still around. You can go and see that. It's in Italy. Yeah. And you were saying something about kings when I interrupted you. <laughs> that's right. So now the first king of, the first king in history to become a Christian was the king of Edessa. His name was Abgar. And he was the first king to ever, uh, and Edessa is where roughly I think our Armenia would be. And you mm. said you had some Armenian mm -hmm. heritage. That's our, the first converted Catholic country in yeah. the history of the world as well, Armenia. Of amazing people. And one of them, after my reversion, when I really, you know, accepted the faith deeply and started studying it, a friend of mine who was working for a, a cancer coalition and, and a nonprofit, he was actually doing work in Armenia and distributing pharmaceuticals uh, to poor communities that were in need. And he actually brought me back a beautiful cross that is is really symbolic of the Armenian Catholic faith and tradition. Mm. And it's a cross with a cross beam that is like angled downward. And uh, I had that for a number of years and then I wound up giving it away in a, in a moment when I just felt God saying, you need to give this yeah. to this particular person. That's beautiful. Um, but yeah, that was the first cross that I wore around my neck wow. um, in the, in the initial part of my journey. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So this King, King Abgar, he was the ruler of, of Edessa and 
tradition. This tradition says that this is the only actual recorded letter that Jesus himself wrote. So this king was experiencing an illness, and he was seeking a cure. And he had heard of this Jesus of Nazareth in a distant land from him. And having been introduced to him by one of the 70 disciples that our Lord had sent out in the Great Commission, he sent the letter through this disciple back to Jesus, saying, I have this... um, Abgar, ruler of Edessa, to Jesus, the good physician who appeared in the country of Jerusalem's greeting. I've heard reports of you and the cures. I need a cure. So through one of the 70 disciples, Jesus responded to him and gave him one thing, a letter. Blessed are you who has believed in me without seeing me. And then gave him an image, wiped his face and sent that along with the letter. And miraculously, his image was on it. That is called the Mandelian. And that is why the first, and he received it, was cured, looked at it. That relic is still here to this day, and that is why the first Christian king to ever convert, converted, wow. according to tradition. Fantastic. Good story. I never, I never heard that story. That's fascinating. Oh, that's the first time I've heard that story. That's awesome. Beautiful. Yeah, and I'll, I'll post a little bit more about that in the, in the link so people can read up on that. It's a really, really fascinating story. Uh, and so letter. that cloth is still available? It is. Where does that exist? Well, so the Mandilian, it was... It was first taken by the Crusaders because it had been in Odessa and it had passed through the the royal houses of the Constantinople uh, emperors. And during one of the Crusades, the sack of of Constantinople in uh, 1204, the Mandelian was taken back to France. Mm. And it was there. It was attested to from that time. And then during the French Revolution, it disappears from the historical record. Oh, wow. But there is recreation or recreations of it. So we know what it looked like essentially, um, but we don't have the original pieces hmm. as far as I understand. Wow. I wonder who they think has it. Well, during the French they Revolution. They burned a lot of stuff. They burned man. a lot of stuff. They burned yeah. bones of saints. They burned yeah. so many relics. relics yeah. and it was pretty, yeah, they yeah. trashed a lot of stuff. Mm. Not good. Yeah. Barbarians. Barbarians, all of them. Yes. So when you're playing Jesus, do you give a particular voice that you use? Do you have any do you do you adopt any sort of accent? I or? do. I oh, u- let, let's I hear use, it. I use a Middle Eastern accent based on my um my um my uncle's wife who's from Palestine. Okay. Cool. Uh, it's a combination of that and my father's accent, uh, Egyptian accent. So it is essentially a Middle Eastern accent, uh, which is not too far from my own voice. I don't really change the timbre or the tone of my voice, but it's uh, more or less in this range here. It's amazing. Mm. That's very good. Do you know Aramaic? Uh, I know the Our Father in Aramaic. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's a beautiful language. Yeah. It's, um, Could you say it for us? I, I can. Let's hear it. Um, and I'll tell you where I got it from. So um, Father Bill Foco is, um, uh, I believe, he's a Jesuit that uh, teaches uh, or has been teaching at Loyola for years. Um, and um, forgive me if I, if I mess this title up. He's got, he's like, like he's a, a man pro- of many titles, professor of like ancient languages. He's an archeologist. He's a theologian. And I found him when I looked for him because he was also the theological consultant uh, and the Aramaic and Latin consultant on the Passion of the Christ. Mm. Oh, awesome. So I kind of tracked him down um, for personal reasons. I wanted to, to, to find, to, to get a, a first century um, a visual depiction of, of the Aramaic language with specific thoughts in mind of, of stuff that now, I want to Now, for listeners who written. don't really know what Aramaic is, Aramaic yeah. is the language that our Lord would have spoken in. That was the lingua franca of the time because you had... Romans and Greeks and Hebrews and uh, Assyrians and Chaldeans. You had all sorts of people. So the common language of the lingua franca would have been Aramaic. Mm-hmm. And that was what our Lord would have spoke in to his disciples, to his mother mm-hmm. and during his ministry. So That's continue, right. Continue, please. So, um, so I've been doing a, a passion play for the last several years. And uh, last year, um, after I had, uh, I actually interviewed Father Fulco and um, I wanted to see if he would give me... Um, a first century Aramaic translation of the Our Father that I could use as a part of a teaching moment in the Passion that we do, um, that we're also doing this year. Um, and so he uh, he basically dug up something he had written because he had been asked to translate it before, and he sent me his, his translation, and I learned it. And uh, I checked to make sure that the pronunciation was right. I sent it to him, and he said, 
you're all good. So I, I performed it last year and, and I might perform it again this year. We'll see. Um, but it goes um, like this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Abundi bashmaya, nefkadashmak, tefe malkusak, nehue tsevyanak, aikan de bashmaya, af bahara. Lachman de sunkanan yamana, havlan yomadein. Washpuklan chavine aikana, dafhanan shpukan le chaivine. Ulo elan lanesiana, la chen atzelan min bisha. Amin. Amen. Oh, wow. Powerful. Consolation through the Very roof. Powerful. That's beautiful. Wow. Amen. Not only does he, we found out that he looks like Jesus, but. <laughs> he talks like him too. He talks like him too. That's amazing. So. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. We got about when we get the same effect. That was that was really amazing. That Thank was you beautiful. That. That really sure. was, Thank man. you. Thank yeah. you for that yeah. for sure. My so pleasure. I mean, I, I think this was this was very cool to you know ponder what our Lord looked like. Now, ultimately, doesn't matter what he looked like. Mm-hmm. It's it's who he was was what he did. That those were the things. You know, if he was just a man and he was just an appearance, it, it doesn't matter. But that he was the, the the Messiah, that he did raise from the dead, those are the things that theologically and historically and spiritually matter. It doesn't matter what he looked like. But I think is, it could, I think it contributes though, Shield. But, I don't it, know, but it's I would, very important to ponder. I would that, I would, that incarnational would, experience. We, we this is so good because you know Ryan Shield and I will have like these sometimes theological, philosophical, or just, just plain out arguments. And you'll call each other heretics. And we'll call each other I heretics. It was kind there. of rough. It was kind of rough last night. La, 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 yeah, la, la, you, you I were in just the midst don't of that listen. Like, yeah, we, were, we were arguing <laughs> over tacos and beer. At Machete's place. At Machete. <laughs> At the Machete. Machete. But, you know, I, I, I lean so often on John Paul II's writings and in the letter to the youth of the world, he said about Mary that Mary steadfastly contemplated the face of Christ. And this devotion to the face of Christ has been so alive in the mystical nature of people's prayers, you know, throughout the history of the church and certainly has been a part of my own prayer journey of meditating on the face of Christ. And so often the contact that I've had with the divine mercy devotion Mm. and, and St. Faustina's revelations and really digging into her diary and getting a picture of the merciful face of Jesus and his gaze of love is something that has brought a huge amount of consolation, similar to when you were just praying the our father, Mm. It, 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 it's a huge amount of wave of consolation. And one of the things that came across my, my desk years ago, Father Mikolenko was the vice postulator. He's an MIC, uh, Marian of the Immaculate Conception, you know, based out of Stockbridge where the National I Shrine of guys, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful priests. Awesome. And a great place awesome of worship. Guy. If you've never been to the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, make sure you go Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Look it up. Go there. It's worth your while. And, you know, he sent me, he was like a spiritual mentor to me and he blessed my chalice, the chalice I was actually mentioning, Joe Fusco, uh, I inherited. Is that the uh, the one with the unicorn? The unicorn chalice. The unicorn chalice. Yeah, Yeah, that's the unicorn chalice. (laughs) We did a a show on unicorns (laughs) in the Bible. And he admitted, is there a unicorn on the chalice? There's a unicorn (laughs) on the chalice. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's become kind of Catholic talk show famous that he has a unicorn on the chalice. And they did not believe me. So right when I got back to the parish, I took a picture and I'm holding like the chalice out like that stem with the show. Show, uh, I know, need a picture unicorn. with that chalice at some point. <laughs> I need a picture. So, so, um, you know, meditating on, on the face of Jesus, this video was sent to me and they transposed the divine mercy image that was the original, painting. the original painting with the shroud of Turin. And it was a perfect match. Whoa. Right. What? And, and granted, like it was really, really cool when father Michelin yeah. sent that to me, this was yeah. years ago. And it just, it was just such a huge wave of, of like shock and awe and wonder because again, we're moving closer and closer to recognizing that face, recognizing that gaze. And I think that's the whole Christian journey, isn't it? It's the whole journey of our faith is, is to truly draw closer into contact and encounter 
the person that is Jesus Christ. And I know for you, one of those productions, the St. Luke production, it was on St. Faustina and you actually played Jesus in the divine mercy. What was that experience like for you? And, and, you know, kind of sharing that revelation. That, um, that was pretty, that was the first time I ever got asked to, to play Christ. And, uh, and, um, yeah, that was about five or six years ago. It was the one woman show that I was talking about mm-hmm. where, where an actress uh, by the name of Maria Vargo, she essentially toured for about three and a half years, did over 300 shows as St. Faustina and the show is all about the, the revelation of, um, uh, you know, the, the divine mercy, the, con- the concept of divine mercy and uh, everything that Jesus gave to St. Faustina. Um, and, uh, it, it sort of, uh, went through all her, her sickness, her illness and, and how she dealt with all the spiritual attacks and everything. So, um, when I got, um, I got called, uh, a friend of mine had heard that they were casting for, for Christ and he, you know, he knew that I was a practicing Catholic and I was an actor and, and, uh, and he said, Hey, I don't know if you'd be interested in this. And so I was, I was vaguely familiar with divine mercy, um, as a devotion, um, I knew about the image uh, through my father, and he, he had been a, a devotee to the Divine Mercy, um, uh, the chaplet, and everything for for years. But I was only familiar with the image. Uh, and an interesting story about how I actually got the job to play Jesus for the the show. I'm Faustina. just picturing like your dad, like getting that phone call. Uh, hey, Dad, I'm going to be playing Jesus in this Divine and Mercy. This, day. And he's like, what? Like, I get just a picture. I was like, like so like, excited. Yes. Now, yes. This is the first time you played Jesus. Is this is the correct? very first yeah. time that I played Jesus. Yes. So um, I love this. It was, I think, an interesting story. I have a little something here. So um, there was... Um, there was a time where I had to, when I was living in New York, before I moved out here, I, when I got cast to play Jesus uh, in Faustina, it was here in Los Angeles. Um, but a f- several years before, um, I was in between, uh, I just had a breakup like a, a year before to a girl that I was engaged to for, for a while. Oh, wow. And it was a long distance, New York, France. Um, and, uh, and it was a really, really tough time for me. And I, I was, you know... I was doing a lot more praying because, you know, many of us tend to turn to God, especially when things are going terribly, mm-hmm. um, uh, which I'm, I, I have a feeling he's fine with. Um, so, you know, I, I, um, I was just doing a lot of praying and, and my dad, I guess, I think had been telling me about his devotion to divine mercy a bit. And, and I was like, ah, oh, it's pretty cool, you know? And, and, um, and I, I always thought to myself, well, um, I would love to have, you know, an image of the divine mercy for my apartment, just something small and like, you know, that I can hang in my little one bedroom in apartment in Queens. Um, but the divine mercy, mercy image that I had seen was not the original painting. It was the, 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 the one of the later ones. And I can't remember the name of the artist, but, uh, I, I just was, I'm an artist myself. I, I draw and I paint, uh, and, but, and I wasn't really thrilled with that kind of depiction. I was like, ah, if I could get the the image of that, but in like a Greek Orthodox style icon, that would be awesome. Wow! Um, because I really, I really felt that there was something about the devotion that I didn't know that had uh, some spiritual power and, and some consolation to it. But I, I'd never seen an icon like a, a, an Orthodox style icon version of that, and. I think I had made that sort of a, as a prayer in, in earnest. And in my apartment building, there was um, outside of my, I lived on the first floor, and outside of my door, there was these mailboxes uh, that were, uh, it was sort of, um, it was like a giant sort of like, a, like, a, like an armoire. And people would leave stuff on top of the armoire, like books and CDs and stuff. And um, I remembered very specifically that uh, three days after I had this prayer about wanting to find this image of the divine mercy as an Orthodox icon, <laughs> this showed up it's amazing. Oh, wow. on the top That's of those awesome. mailboxes wow. outside. And I've never seen anything like I've that. I've never seen before. anything like that either. Yeah. Three days later. That is so powerful, brother. 
And that icon itself has been a part of my journey in Medjugorje because there's a chapel that's along this wadi that the Turks were coming in and invading Medjugorje. And it was just like poor farmers at that time. Mm. And they were able to ward off just by like pitchfork and just brute force this massive army. And then they got lost in the woods and, and went off. But they have a chapel dedicated to the divine mercy right there. And it's a huge icon of that. That was wow. the first time I saw it. And it is. It's such a special icon of the divine mercy. Wow. That's very cool. So I took this inside immediately. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it must have been five or six years later, I told that story to the director of that show about Faustina. And he's like, when can you start? Uh, that, was, that was how I got that job. So I, I love it because that was actually awesome. one of the, the questions I wanted to ask you, Jonathan, mm -hmm. is how did you wind up getting in the position of playing Jesus? It's just like your look. And then it's like, you, you just have to do this, but that is such a power, even more of a powerful story yeah. than just appearance yeah. because it's a commission from mm -hmm. God and God is totally communicating through icons, no doubt. But the fact that he put that icon up on that armoire yeah. where it was like, you know, free use kind of a that's, thing. That's yeah. holy, holy mail, right? Too, yeah. Holy yeah. mail. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> Doesn't get much much clearer than that. Does no, it? It if does all not. prayers could just be answered that oh. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, none of the ones. I mean, yeah. That, that's probably the first time I kind of had something that was that specific, mm -hmm. and then it showed up. Yeah, um, it still kind of boggles my mind. And I truly believe, and I, I've seen it over and over again, and the people that I've received that are in most the most amount of turmoil in their life, and and at a pivotal crossroads, and great pain and suffering. In that place, God acts in human history and intervenes in people's lives and gives them the inspiration and the encouragement that they need to be able to walk in the path that they're supposed to. That leads mm. them to greater fulfillment and a greater sense of solidarity. And, and I'm on this path towards salvation. And it's like the wind that is at your back in those moments. And it's the springtime of, of, of faith mm -hmm. a lot of times as well. It's where everything begins. And it, it's like that gust of wind that just... <sighs> It pushes the boat that you're on yeah. in the in the right direction toward new horizons. It's yeah. beautiful, beautiful yeah. story. So, Jonathan, what kind of projects do you have coming up? Um, I, I know that you are continuing your being typecast as as Jesus. So, what, what do you got coming God. up? Yeah, yeah um, I've got a project that I'm working on now that I, I think I can probably talk about in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, for the moment, I have to keep stum, as they say. Um, Will you give us a little exclusive? Maybe so, but we you could also, have but you're also, I you're might also possibly doing, be able to do that. That would yeah. be cool. Yeah. But you're also doing a, a production right now. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so currently I'm in the midst of um, producing, uh, co-producing, co-directing, uh, and acting in uh, a passion play um, called The Last Days, The Passion and Death of Jesus the Christ. And uh, it started as... Um, it was sort of born out of a, uh, a living stations of the cross kind of um, performance that had been going on several years in Santa Monica um, at St. Monica uh, Catholic Church, which is a beautiful, mm -hmm. wonderful community. Um, and then we performed, we were asked to my co-director, uh, Maria Vargo, who, who was Faustina in that show. Um, that sort of started our working relationship and then she, uh, when she was performing in the Living Stations of the Cross, she is, she's also, she also directs, uh, she, there, there, uh, about three years ago, the Jesus, uh, at St. Monica's who had been performing Living Stations of the Cross, um, I think he, he was, he got married and moved to Colorado. So, uh, they needed a new Jesus and, uh, I had played Jesus a couple of times by that point. So. Um, I committed to doing it. And then, uh, I think a year or two years later, um, they wanted to, you know, so the, so the living stations of the cross for people who don't know is, is, um, uh, it's based on the, the sort of 14 serialized moments in, uh, Christ's, uh, arrest and passion and death, um, that is, uh, accompanied with a number of prayers, sometimes hymns. And if it's performed as like, uh, a sort of a reenactment, you have actors that portray all those, um, characters in those moments, those individual stations, individual yeah. stations. Yeah. And so it's often a processional in, um, uh, on a campus of a church, you know, they, they try to go around and move it around so people can actually feel like they're walking with Christ on his, on his journey. Very cool. Um, for technical reasons, last year, they asked us to no longer process around the church campus, 
um, because like, you know, the mics, the wireless signals were just getting uh, interfered with. So they asked, asked us to adapt it That's to cool. an interior sort of uh, yeah. pro- Stage project. Stage presentation. Yeah. And, and make it more like um, John Paul's scriptural stations of the cross. So we sort of rewrote the production and um, titled it The Last Days. And we started with some teaching moments of Jesus, which is where the, uh, the um, Our Father in Aramaic came in for me to cool. have that opportunity to, to allow people to hear what that sounds like because most people have never heard or will never hear what the Our Father sounds like in Aramaic. So I, I, I'm really honored that you let me do that here. Oh, that's so blessed. It's, it's yeah, such a special you. thing. Uh, and so it, it was so overwhelmingly received um, that, you know, for me, um, playing Christ has become something of a ministry uh, and, a, and an evangelization uh, tool uh, and a way to use my, my gifts and talents to, to serve God, uh, quite literally. And um, so we've, we've now moved to a larger space um, in Koreatown, actually, to some um, French Gothic cathedral called Emmanuel Presbyterian. And it's, it's a very... Um, it's it's open to everybody. We're we're essentially we want to try to reach as many people as possible with this, and just mm-hmm. you know introduce Christ and His sacrifice to to the the world at large. Um, and so we're now doing this um, down the street here, um, and it's uh, it's going to be coming up in in April. We've got five performances in uh, in April leading up to Good Friday. So we have um, two weeks before the fifth and sixth the 12th and 13th of April, and then we have Good Friday itself at uh, 3 o'clock. Very cool. Is there a website that people can get more information or buy tickets or get time Absolutely. Set? Tickets and donations are, are being accepted because we've now got a whole host of expenses we didn't have before. Yeah. Uh, and the project is it's expanding and it's, it's, it's going to be extraordinary. So many people are coming out to Good. help us with this. Um, so the, uh, the website is thelastdayspassionplay.com. Um, spelled like it sounds, the last days. And we'll make sure that we put a link in the the comments here so that you guys can uh, click through and learn some more about that. And if you're in the area, you can buy tickets and attend. That would be really cool. Absolutely. I've I've got to say, you know, since Jonathan and I have been talking, we have a lot of overlapping experiences and Mm. backgrounds and whatnot. And and the the funny thing, where are you from in, in Manhattan originally? I was born in Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> wow! And that's where my that's, gran- that's where my grandfather was born. The greatest uh, the greatest man in my life, you know. And then John Paul II immediately after my grandfather. Um, but as we, so, as going so on, as go- Rich's grandfather, Jesus, and Daredevil. <laughs> yeah, and Daredevil. Uh, Daredevil. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, but right. you know what's cool is I was a youth director for a couple of years before discerning priesthood, and then going off to Ave Maria and starting the formal education in philosophy, theology, etc. But I, as I was, you know, directing the youth group and starting a youth mass and a youth choir and all these different things, it was just really a wonderful springtime in, in, in my faith and ministry. But I actually utilized that same Stations of the Cross and did a living stations with what? the kids that I directed and, and we oh, had music awesome. and, and we, we really expressed ourselves artistically. And it's just, I love the fact that you are, it's like that same kind of wavelength of, of, you know, meditating on what is God calling me to do mm. and how I can, how I can spread the gospel, how I can be evangelical in nature. And this, this message is for all, you know, it's and to all. realize that. And for all time. And it's now, I, I don't think there's, in my lifetime, I, I think there hasn't been a more urgent need for for this message than than now. Amen, brother. Yeah. So, Jonathan, um, we really want to thank you for for joining us on the show. It's been really cool, and great, and I yeah. think it's gotten given us a lot of insight into um, you know contemplating the face of the Lord. And now, I don't know if you how I, I know you listen to the show and you're familiar. Mm-hmm. At the end of every episode, we do the Inquisition, right. where we we give Father Rich a question and. Uh, we're and gonna, since Jesus is here and <laughs> mercy, Jesus is merciful, we're going to take it. We're going to take it easy on you. And instead, I'm, the Inquisition question is: Lead us in the. Will you lead us in prayer of the Holy Face of Jesus? Oh, I'd be happy to. So here awesome. All right. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Holy Face of Jesus, be my joy. Holy Face of Jesus, be my strength. Holy face of Jesus, be my health. Holy face of Jesus, be my courage. Holy face of Jesus, 
Be my wisdom. Holy face of Jesus, image of the Father, provide for me. Holy face of Jesus, mirror of thy priestly heart, be my zeal. Holy face of Jesus, gift of the Spirit, show me thy love. Holy face of Jesus, saddened by sorrow, grant my requests through thy merits. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Great episode, guys. Thank you. Again, everyone, um, we're going to put the links to uh, the projects that Jonathan's got going on. Make sure you go and see that. Make sure you get to catholictalkshow.com. You can subscribe to us on YouTube and iTunes there. Uh, we really appreciate when you do. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, you can also go to Catholic Talk Show, or I'm sorry, patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show, and you can support us there. And you can help us to continue make great episodes like this. And I really think this was a great episode. Again, really, thank you for coming. It was thank you this guys. was a very cool, you. very cool show to do. Thanks for yeah. having me. Thank you for having and, me. And just know of our prayers and, and just my request to everybody that's listening in or viewing, please support Jonathan with your mm. prayers and your intentionality because thank he's you. a part of this beautiful wave of artistic expression of showing the mercy of God through his evangelical charism. So let's support him in prayer. And lift him up in all of his endeavors that they may be prospered in God's glory and truly touch hearts and souls. So, Jonathan, thank, thank you, you so much again, brother. Thank you, God guys. bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Well, I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you who are listening in, you should be watching, yes. seriously, because you want to see Jesus' face. Because <laughs> right. right. the bobblehead is approving of Jonathan Rumi. <laughs> how did, and so should you. How did he do? <laughs> all right. Excellent. That thumbs up, Jesus. <laughs> all right. See you next time. Catholic Talk Show. God bless. Bye. Bye. Bye.